here with everybody. Um, I really thought Michael's message last Sunday was really, really timely, really good about raising up spiritual sons and daughters, raising up, being those kind of parents you need to be, both uh, spiritual and, you know, just natural parents is so important for the day and age we live in. Larry was so right, as there is right now a great falling away, and it's important for us as parents to be those that foundation that uh, helps establish his faith in our children. And so very, very important. And uh, it was, you know, it was interesting because we're driving up to the mountains and Michael was talking and Michael didn't realize that Ellie was in the back seat listening. And so, you know, he had a, a quite a number of stories about Ellie. Um, and it was classic looking back in the mirror and just watching Ellie eye roll and just be like, you know, one time she's like, text her dad, dad, I am listening to the message. So I'm listening right now to what you say. You know, the fact that Michael said you're on a leash and, you know, we started telling Ellie, okay, okay, uh, get it back on your leash, Ellie. And then one time Ellie, Michael said, uh, I think he said, uh, no child. And Ellie, you know, that was, that was pretty fun joking about that, but it was, it was really, really funny seeing, uh, seeing uh, Ellie's response to Michael. It was very classic. So anyway, very important. So this is uh, session 15. This is part two, Enabling Grace. And um, I, you know, just, you know, we, I didn't get enough time to last time to, talk, to finish the whole thing. But what I wanted to do is start off again with John chapter one and talk about the, uh, the importance of grace, the importance of grace, so vital that we really have that, that understanding of the grace of God. John chapter 1, verse 16, or verse uh, 17, let's start with verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received. Now notice, notice what the fullness of God is. And grace upon grace. The fullness of God is grace upon grace. So if we're going to have the fullness of Jesus Christ, we need the fullness of grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, that would be the truth, with no grace, with no power, that would give you the ability to obey. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And last, in the last message, I, I read the quote by Francis Frangipan, and it's an incredible quote. I wish I would have come up with it, but it's an incredible quote that if you ever hear a teaching and feel as though it were unattainable in your condition, you've only heard half the message. On Thursday, uh, the, not last Thursday, but the Thursday before, we had a forerunner school call, and we're going in our forerunner school call, and we were talking about just some of the eternal rewards that God is offering to his people. And these eternal rewards are not automatic just because you're born again, justified, and heaven bound. These eternal rewards are given because you have lived an overcoming life and the nature of Jesus Christ has been conformed within you, has been formed in you. And, you know, all of us, after about 30 minutes or an hour, all of us were like, geez, we're really, it was really, if you're on that call, raise your hand if you were challenged. I mean, it was, it was challenging. It, it's, when you really unpack the eternal rewards God offers us that are given to those who live an overcoming lifestyle by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's really challenging when you, when you really understand these things and you can feel as if it's unattainable in your condition. You can feel as if there's no way I could ever live up to the standard of God that he's calling me to live. And if you've ever felt that way, just uh, I say this over again, over and over again, if you've ever felt that way, you've only heard half the message. Because in the new covenant, every time God's truth is given, his grace is also given. So anytime God challenges you, and believe me, he does challenge us, doesn't he? 
Anytime God challenges you, if, if you feel as if you cannot attain to that condition, or you cannot attain to that truth in your present condition, you've only heard half the message. You've only heard the truth. You haven't heard the grace. You haven't heard the power of Jesus Christ in you if you're a Christian. That gives you the power to obey what God has called you to do. And so you missed, you missed the grace that is always resident in the heart of God's truth. Truth without grace, I love this, is only half true. Truth without grace is only half true. Remember this always, grace and truth are realized in Jesus Christ. What God's truth demands, his grace provides. What God's truth demands, his grace provides. God's truth is you are to make yourself ready. God's truth is only the pure in heart will see God. God's truth is without sanctification, no one will see the Lord. God's truth is be holy as I am holy. God's truth is be perfect as I am perfect. God's truth is don't judge. God's truth is, you know, love like I love. God's truth is way up here. And if you feel as if that's impossible, you've only heard half the story because whatever God's truth demands, his grace provides. God's grace gives you the power to obey what his truth demands. Thank you, Lord. We've been going through in this indwelling life teaching different laws or principles of the spirit-led life. And the number six, the sixth law of the spirit is this. God's grace empowers you to obey what his truth demands. Thank you, God. God's grace empowers you to obey what his truth demands, enabling you to abide in Christ deeper because remember, Jesus said that if you, abide, if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love and to yield Christ-like fruit in abundance. God's grace empowers you to obey his truth, what his truth demands, enabling you to abide in Christ deeper and yield Christ-like fruit in abundance. Okay, and then one last review before we move on to part two is my definition of grace. After looking at Bible dictionaries, searching the scriptures, working all this out, here's what I came up with a definition of grace. Is grace is unmerited, the unmerited power of God. It can't be earned. It can only be received. It can't be achieved. It's the unmerited power of God that enables you to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil, to be who God calls you to be. And that we talked about all of that in the last session. And this is what, from this point on in this definition, is what we're going to talk about in this session. To do what God calls you to do, operating when you are conscious of your need by giving you new desires and the ability to respond to God's truth from the heart. It's a lot to unpack. So we talked about the first half of that in the last session. We're going to talk about the, starting with what God's grace gives you the power that enables you to do, not just to be, but enables you to do. And what I've found is that as we go deeper in the grace of God, a lot of times people get set free from a performance-oriented Christianity where we're, they're just living for God, doing for God. We got to do more things for God so He'll like us. We got to, you know, we got to do. We got to read the Bible more, pray more, fast more. All that we need to do. We need to witness more. We need to go on mission trips. All those things we need to do. But we get into this performance mode of Christianity, and when we understand that God, what God's grace is, and He calls us into a relationship with Him. What I've found a lot of times is Christians gravitate, they, they move the pendulum swings and they go from doing, doing, doing to not doing anything at all and becoming lukewarm, apathetic, and, and just sitting there not doing one thing for God. And I'm, I mean by his life, by his power. God's grace does not mean that we become passive. God's grace does not mean we don't do anything. We don't use our gifts. We don't use our talents. Dallas Willard said that grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Now catch that. That's very important. God's grace is not opposed 
to effort. In fact, Paul said, I labor more than all of you, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. God's grace empowered Paul to labor relentlessly to build up the church and to establish the church. God's grace is not opposed to effort. Okay, just get that in your mind because sometimes, again, we gravitate, the pendulum swings all the way over here into the stagnant Christianity of what James talked about, faith without works is dead. If you're not doing from your faith what God commands you to do in obey, obedience to the Great Commission, your faith likely is dead. God's grace empowers you to do. Amen? You there? Grace is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning. Grace cannot be achieved. Grace can only be received. Grace is given as you believe in faith. As you believe in faith, God's grace is transmitted to your human spirit, flowing into your heart, empowering your obedience to live from him by his life in motive, thought, and deed. See, we've got to understand that God has called us to do good works. See, what, I want to ask you, what good works are you doing? Now, obviously, we're not doing them for God. We're doing them out of our relationship with God, like we talked about in a previous session. We're not living for God. We're living from God. But what good works are you doing to advance the kingdom of God? See, the Lord has called us to do more than just have quiet times with Jesus. I love quiet times with Jesus. I love spending time waiting on the Lord for what he's, you know, what he's speaking and what he's saying and get into his word and praying and meditating and all these things. But God has also called you to do. God's also called you to do. I want to challenge you to just to, to think, okay, Lord, what is it you're calling me to do to advance your kingdom? What is it you're calling me to do to, in, in discipling the nations? What is it you're calling me to do to preach the gospel, to get the gospel out? I mean, I'm not saying you have to be a preacher, but what is it? What, how are you doing what God has called you to do? And it's grace that gives you that power. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Paul is writing... I just want you to see this here. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul's writing to the Ephesians. And he says, he's writing about God's eternal purpose. He's writing about God's ultimate intention. That's what the whole book of Ephesians is really about. The eternal purpose of God in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. And Paul says here, is that we are his workmanship. You are God's workmanship. You are God's beautiful creation. Even if you don't feel that way, you are God's beautiful creation. Psalms, I love Psalms 139. Is that even before there's a thought in my mind, you know it. You formed me, and you formed me before I was even born. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God knew you before the foundation of the world. He is madly in love with you. You are his workmanship. And catch this. He goes on to say is, he created you for good works. He created you in Christ Jesus for good works. There are good works you are called to do because you are his workmanship. Those works flow out of who you are and who you become to him. They're not, again, these are not about doing things for God. They're about being, and out of your being, doing. See, we've gotten it reversed in the Western church. In the Western church, we say it's about doing, and then you become. It's actually the opposite in the kingdom. You see what I'm saying? In the Western church, it's I do it, and because I did this work, I become someone. And the Lord's like, no, if you do that, I'm going to tear it all down because you're doing it in your own name and for your own fame. In the kingdom, it's about being. And out of your being, out of your becoming, 
in your relationship with Jesus Christ than you do out of your being. Does that make sense? You guys are looking at me like, what on earth are you talking about? Out of your relationship with God and who he calls you to be, to be his friend, to be his lover, to be his servant, out of that relationship, then you do those good works that he's created for you. Not just to come up with a good work and go, oh, okay, this is a good idea. I'm going to go off and do this for God. And the Lord's like, I never called you to do that. I never said you to do that. I never sent you out to do that. I'm not talking about fleshly works. I'm talking about those works that flow out of your relationship with Christ. That in being, you do. You don't do to be someone. Okay, you guys are looking at me like, okay, am I speaking like Gen Z slang here? Like, uh, you know, we went to uh, <laughs> the ride up to Blue Ridge. They, I got educated on what Gen Z slang is. So I feel like I'm talking Gen Z slang to you guys. Like, you know, I learned about gorge and what gorge means. Did you know what gorge means? It doesn't mean gorge like when you eat food. It means you're gorgeous. Did you know that no cap means no lie or bussin means uh, good food or, uh, you know, slay doesn't actually mean to kill somebody, but it means you're really cool. They have like 150 adjectives for cool. I feel like I'm speaking Gen Zing slang to some of you guys right now. <laughs> Hello, God has created you for good works. You're meant to slay it and be lit and legit. <laughs> it's, it's pretty fun, actually. I, yeah, I... Yeah, anyway, I could go on and on, but God has created you for good works. It's vital you find out what those good works are because you're going to give an account for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Grace empowers you to do what he's called you to do. Grace empowers you to do what he's called you to do. See, Ephesians 1.10, he goes on and he says, which God prepared. Listen to this. God prepared these works beforehand, before the foundation of the world, before you were created. God prepared these works for you so that you would walk in him, walk in them. God wrote your biography before you were born and it's vital that we live according to his script. Do you know what that is for your life? Do you know what that is for your life? I'm not saying, I'm not trying to like heap a bunch of condemnation on you. Wherever you are in life, okay, you may have missed it for 20, 30 years. God is a good God. He will get you back on that path. He will get you back on that path to life if you turn and ask him, Lord, okay, what are you calling me to do? Where I'm at in life? Where my, what, is my, what is the purpose you've given to me in relation to your eternal purpose? What is that, Lord? What am I called to do? And I, I have no idea what you're called to do. I have no idea how God will use you. I don't know. You ask him. But here's the thing. We're going to give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. Did we fulfill? Did we live our lives according to the script, according to the works God created for us and our own unique abilities and our own unique talents and our own unique culture and time in which we live. Did we fulfill what God has called us to fulfill? See, God may, you know, whether it doesn't, you know, not everyone's called to ministry, whether you're an engineer, an author, a housewife, a software programmer, a pastor, a consultant, a missionary, whatever it is God has called you to do, His grace provides you with the power to do it. See, God's grace enables you to multiply your talents. God does not, the Lord does not want you just to have one or two talents and just sit there idly buried. What happens is grace gives you the power to multiply your talents. Remember the parable of the talents? The one guy got five talents, and I haven't read the story in a while, but I think he multiplied them and, and gained five more. Another one had two, and he gained two more. The Lord wants you and me to multiply the talents. The talents would be 
whatever God's given you. It could be gifts. It could be talents. It could be treasure. It could be money. It could be resources, influence. It could be a million different things of what God's given you. How are you taking those things God has entrusted to you as a steward and multiplying them? How are you multiplying them? Because you'll remember the one servant who had that one talent and he didn't think that talent was much and so he buried that talent and the Lord looked at him and said, you wicked, lazy slave. Can you, can, and he doesn't lose his salvation. I don't believe he loses his salvation. But can you imagine standing at the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord saying to you, because he will say this to those who do not take what God's given them and multiply it, you wicked, lazy slave. That's a challenge to us, isn't it? God's grace empowers you to do what he's called you to do. I, I remember, I'm just thinking back on my life, is like what I'm doing right now is not natural gifting. Like, you know, just thinking about my journey and like how I'm now writing books. I remember, I don't, you know, just everyone who is in, in school, like Anna's agents, I'll just close your ears here for a second. I don't think I ever read one book in high school. I, I, I read Cliff Notes every single time. I, they were so boring. I hated reading books. I get into college. I made C's in English in high school. I get into college, and I have this college English class, class, and we have to write this five-page paper or something like that on this poem called Ode to a Grecian Urn. And I read, I read, I read the poem, and I'm like, I don't even have one, have zero clue what this is even talking about. Owed to a Grecian urn. I'm like, what is this even talking about? Had to hire a tutor to even tell me. And she tells me, I'm like, how did you get that out of this? I mean, like, how did you even, how in the world did you get that out of this? There's no way that that, what you just told me it means is what I would ever have gotten. So, I mean, it's like my I mean, I made C's in, in English in high school and in college, and, you know, it's like now God uses me to write. Go figure. God will take your weakness and make it a strength. I remember even, even related to public speaking, I remember we had a public speaking class in college, and I used to be very um, self-conscious about my, my cut-off thumb. I was in high school, so I used to be very self-conscious about that. And I had a prosthesis, and I had this real fear that I would be speaking and would just like fall off while I'm speaking in public speaking, for real. Get sweaty and just like pop off. So, so what I would do is when I was, when I was speaking in, in public speaking in that class, I would put my hand in my pocket, and even back then, I still had hand movements all over the place. It's the way I'm made. And so I was just talking like this, you know, in my public speaking class with my hand buried in my pocket, and... The, you know, I got a lot of critiques, but one of the critiques was like, you got this flapping right hand, you know, just, just you got to get rid of the flapping right hand. So my, my point is God will take, usually will take your, not always, he, he, even if you're naturally talented at something, he will at least crucify it. So you're not operating based on your own soul power, but he'll crucify it so that you operate by his life, or he'll take what you're weak at and, and in your weakness make it your strength. So I just want to encourage you, what is the gifts and the talents that God has given you to use to multiply the kingdom? Get going right away. Get going right away. I mean, we have, if you need something to do, we've got a lot to do. We've got, you know, we're basically trying to uh, make the bride ready in Africa, all right? That's a massive undertaking. We, we, we need help. So if you want to help and you want to use your talents, we will, we've got plenty for you to do. Just beware. Is if you ever find a problem, you realize we will say, okay, you're the solution to it. So anyway, just want to encourage you. Find out what God's called you to do in relation to his eternal purpose to advance his kingdom and do it with all your heart. And what will happen is you will begin to get better and better and better at whatever gift God's given you. Romans 12, 6 says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Notice this. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. God's grace gives you gifts. 
Every single believer in Jesus Christ, when you're born again, God gives you gifts. Some might be natural. You might be just the outflowing of your natural gifting. Some might just be like me, totally unnatural. And God shows you his grace in your weakness. But God gives you gifts according to his grace. And here's what Paul says. Exercise them accordingly. Don't just bury the talent. Don't just bury the gift. Use those gifts for his kingdom. 1 Peter 4.10 says basically the same thing. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another. This is, this is what's key about here. In the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter so much what your gift is. What matters most is you're a servant. See, it's not like, okay, you're in the kingdom of God and you've got a teaching gift or you've got a writing gift or you've got a musical gift. Therefore, you're better than someone who's got an, a gift of mercy or a gift of exhortation. That does not make you better in the kingdom of God. What God's looking for most in giving you these gifts is that you serve the body with those gifts. And you serve the body with those gifts by the empowerment of God's grace. God's grace gives you the power to do what God's called you to do. And Peter goes on, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards. Good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Did you know that one of the things we're going to be judged at judged for at the judgment seat of Christ is were we a good steward of what God had given us? The revelation God has given us. The, the gifts God has given us. The money God has given us. The connections God has given us. The influence God has given us. Whatever the Lord has given us, we're going to be judged before the judgment seat of Christ, did we use these gifts? Did we use these talents, these resources, this money, these things as good stewards for the Lord's purpose in advancing his kingdom? Or did we use them for ourselves? Or did we bury them and do nothing with what God had entrusted to us? See, God's grace gives you the power to do what he's called you to do. He's called me to write. He's called me to speak. I was a terrible speaker, and I was a terrible writer. And God said, okay, in your weakness, I'm going to give my power in you, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do something in you that if it happens good, and anything good comes out of it, you know where you came from. You made C's in English, and you had a flapping right hand when you spoke. If anything good comes out of it, you know it's the grace of God, and I do. It's the grace. If anything comes good out of this, it's the grace of God. God's grace gives you that power to do what God has called you to do. See, if the message of grace has lulled you to sleep, if the message of grace has caused you to be lukewarm, if the message of grace has caused you to bury your talent, it's not grace you're really hearing. Because God's grace gives you power to do what God's called you to do. Kind of get an amen. Y'all are silent here. You hear it with me? Here's the thing about grace. Grace operates when you know your need. It's probably the part about grace we don't like. We're naturally self-sufficient. We're naturally independent. We're naturally like, I can do this myself, God. I don't need your help. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For power, his power, is perfected in weakness. When you are weak, then you are strong. That's the paradox of God's grace in operation. When you are weak, then you are strong. When you're going through trials and difficulties and circumstances and tribulation and feel as if I can't move one more step forward and you say, God, help me, that is when you're at the greatest place where God's power comes and gives you what you can't do in your own strength and power. And Paul said, once I, I'm summarizing here, Paul was like, once I found that out, 
I said, I'm going to gladly rejoice when I'm persecuted. I'm going to gladly rejoice when I'm afflicted. And I'm not there yet, but that's where Paul was. I'm going to gladly rejoice when I'm going through things because I know when I'm going through the fire and I'm going through the trial and I'm going through the adversity and I'm going through this pain and I'm going through these things, Paul said, I know when I'm going through those things, his power will be made perfect in my weakness. That's grace. When you don't know your need... When you think, I've got this, God, I can do it myself, like the Laodicean church. The Laodicean church said, we, we have everything. We have money. We have blessings. We have every single need met. And the Lord says, you, know, you don't even know you're blind, wretched, miserable, poor, or naked. The Laodiceans thought, we've got everything, every need met. And the Lord's like, you're a total mess. Their problem wasn't that they were a mess. Their problem was they didn't know they were a mess. Because God can take our situation by his enabling grace, by his powerful grace, and transform every situation, every trial, everything we're going through. God's grace can give us the power to be who he's called us to be and to do what he's called us to do when we know our need. When we know our need. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that obviously doesn't mean we can't live our lives. We can't live our normal lives, go to work, take care of the kids, you know, do the normal things around the house or whatever. Live our lives normally. We can do all of that without Christ because... Most of the world is doing that without Christ. What the Lord's talking about when he said, you can do nothing without me, he's talking about living the abiding life. He's talking about bearing any type of fruit for God. You cannot, it is humanly impossible to, to produce the kind of fruit God's looking for in and of your own self. You can do nothing, you can do nothing apart from him. Nothing, nothing that's of value to God apart from him. No fruit apart from him. Nothing that pleases God apart from him. That's why the Lord says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Unless you abide in this vine, unless you, ha unless you live from this union with Christ, unless you live from this place of spiritual union with Christ, spirit to spirit union with Christ, where his life is transmitting into you, and you're living by this sap, and this sap of his divine life, his divine nature is flowing through you as life, filling your heart, changing your mind, producing fruit. The Lord says, if you're not abiding in me, if you're not staying connected in me, if you're allowing your soul to live, if you're not living by, by the life of Christ, but you're living by self-life in the soul, if you're allowing all of those things, the Lord says, you can do nothing. And so grace is this realization that I can do nothing, I can do nothing apart from him. I cannot please him. I cannot produce fruit for him. I cannot become who he wants me to be. I can do nothing. And the sooner we realize that apart from him we can do nothing, the sooner we will come in to tap into this divine life, this indestructible life of the grace of God. So if you think about it, you cannot, you cannot save yourself you cannot justify yourself. You cannot regenerate your human spirit. You cannot allow, you cannot get the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. You can't do any of that. You can't, the, the, just as if you, you cannot be saved by any other way but God himself doing it. You can't be raised up to heavenly places in your own, uh, in your own strength. You can't do any of that. But the same way we come in salvation by it's all God's doing is the same way we're meant to live every day of our life. Is we're meant to live by his life. We're meant to live by his life. And only he can live his life. You can't live his life. If you live your own life, 
his life will be stifled within you. If you live for self, his life will not flow. His life will be stagnant. That's why it takes yielding to the life of God like sap so his life can flow through you. That's why Zechariah said it's not by power, and that's why we say this all the time. It is not by power. It's not by human power. It's not by human might. It's not by human gifting. It's not by human resources. It's not by human talent. It's not by any of those things. Not by might, not by power. But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It is the Lord from beginning to end. And what he is looking for in us is to yield to him. To yield to him so that we might fully produce his life in union with him. Paul said in Romans 7, 18, nothing good dwells in me. This is the Apostle Paul, as a Christian, said nothing good dwells in me. Now, he wasn't talking about the life of Christ. He was talking about his flesh. Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. He told the Corinthians, I am nothing. So Paul said, there is nothing good in me that is in my flesh, and I am nothing. And so the sooner we come, and I'm not talking about glory, you know, some people get like, like glory in this. I am nothing. I'm a wretched, I'm a wretched sinful worm. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about this, this realization that I cannot live the Christian life. I cannot live the Christ life. I can't do it. I can do nothing for him. I, I like to say in prayer, just to remind my proud, stubborn, independent self, I like to say to myself in prayer, I like to say to the Lord in prayer, I am nothing, I can do nothing, and in my flesh dwells no good thing. Because what I find when I come into agreement with what God sees about me, and he's like, yes, you're right, what I find is when I do that, the power of grace that cannot be achieved, can only be received, that operates by faith, the power of his grace begins to flow, and that power begins to bring transformation. That power begins to bring change. That power begins to bring a new life, a divine life, an indestructible life that flows through me like sap, so Christ in me is living rather than myself. And you, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, when the Lord said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. And, and again, this is not, some people get, some people get to take way out of extreme and go, I'm a wretched sinner. I'm wicked and all this stuff. And, and, and they just, they live in that and they glory in that. And that's not what God's looking for. But that poverty of spirit where we say, God, I can do nothing, I am nothing, and in my flesh dwells no good thing. I have a great need of you. I have a great need of your grace. Lord, would you allow your transforming power, would you allow your enabling power to come and strengthen me so that I can live by your life? See, the sooner we come to this realization that the flesh is worthless to God, the sooner we can get into the Christ-like life. See, if you read the scriptures, you realize that the Bible has, not, has nothing good to say about the flesh. The flesh is worthless. The body, and is, uh, and with the, it's sinful, not, not the body itself, but the sin in the body, coupled together with the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, that flesh working is depraved. And that's why Paul said, if you live according to the flesh, you cannot please God. The flesh is rebellious against God. The flesh cannot please God. The flesh is worthless to God. That's why it's only Christ in me. Christ living in me, Christ living through me. It's Christ, Christ, Christ. He's the only value in you. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. He loves you, obviously. But what, it, what I'm saying is this. The more we realize is the flesh profits nothing, the flesh can do nothing of value to God, the more we come into this realization that I must live by his indwelling life. God help me. I don't want to live in the flesh. 
See, the flesh has, just like the tree of the knowledge of good and the tree of the knowledge of evil, has two sides to it. There's a good side and an evil side, and the flesh has a good side, and the flesh has an evil side. We probably know the evil side, the lawlessness, the rebellion, the independence, the, the, the depravity, the defiling sins. We know those things, but the good side, the self-righteousness, the Oh, the doing good works for God. You know, though that, that good side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I can live for God in my own strength. The more we come to realize, the more we come to realize that the flesh, the good or the bad, profits nothing, the more I come to realize that, the more I can live by his life to say, God, I need you. God, I need you. Not only does, does grace operate when we know our need, but grace gives you new desires to obey. This is what I love about grace. God did not create a robot. I've been studying about, I'm getting ready to write two books, and I've been studying about salvation. There's massive debate between Calvinists and Arminians about did God give us free will and all this stuff, and you know, obviously, God did give us free will. I don't believe what the Calvinists believe. But God did not create us as a robot to just program into us what he wants us to do. God did not create. God wanted lovers, not robots. And because God wanted lovers, God, you know, he will not force us to obey him. But what happens is what grace does, what God's grace does, God's grace influences the heart. And when God's grace influences the heart, what happens is you begin to want to obey God, not out of obligation, but out of desire. Out of desire. Instead of saying, oh, I've got to obey God, you get, you change and your grace says, now I get to obey God. See, under the law, the law says, you must, you shall. Grace says, God in grace says, I will, and I will come in you, and I will transform you, and I will change your heart. And when God changes your heart, now the desires to live by his life, the desires to obey him become natural. And so now you want to obey God from the heart in motive and thought and deed. Then you become a lover and not a robot. And you obey God because grace influences your heart. See, grace changes that grin and bear it, legalistic. I've got to just, you know, give it my grit, the, everything in my soul to obey God where I've got to do it, but internally you don't really want to do it. Grace changes your heart. So from the inside out, you obey God from the heart. And your obedience to God comes from the heart. We've we got we to keep in mind, the, every, the heart is everything to God. The heart is everything to God. If you obey God and it's not from the heart, it's better than disobedience, but it doesn't, it's not what God is after. God is after not the, not the kind of obedience we see in the law, that kind of obedience that's, external conformity, behavior modification. You're, you're obeying a set of external rules, but in your heart you want those things you can't have. That's not the, the obedience under grace. See, grace does not give you, grace does not make obedience optional. Grace makes obedience possible. Grace does not make obedience optional. Grace makes obedience possible. What God's truth demands, God's grace works in your heart so that new desires are formed in your heart, so that now you want to obey God more than you want to sin. Grace is divine influence upon the heart. Strong's Dictionary defines grace as just that, divine influence upon the heart. I love that definition. Divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. In other words, God's grace, God's grace works in your heart, and that working of God's grace in your heart is then reflected outwardly in fruit that you bear from grace. So 
See, we've got a problem right now in the church, and I believe it's the problem that, that the Lord is, is highlighting right now is most of the church for almost 2,000 years have lived by the externals. The externals that, you know, is about the building. It's about, you know, how many people you baptize. It's about your budget. It's about all these things we do for God, yet the heart is not in alignment with God. It's doing for God, not doing, not living from God. And so it's the heart that God wants to recover. You know, one of the things, you know, just to give you an example, one of the things that God has put on our heart is for this, the church in Africa. And one of the assignments God has given us as forerunners is to go to Africa and to make a bride ready in, in, in East, East Africa especially, to make a bride ready. But one of the things we're finding out in Africa, just even through our conversations with our leaders, is most of the church in Africa is focused on the externals. Signs, wonders, miracles, deliverance. All those things are important. All those things are biblical. Now, not the way most of them do it there. It's very much soulish and very much carnal. It's very much not God. But, the, but signs, wonders, miracles is very much biblical. But they're so focused on the externals where the church is drawn to the man of God and the man of God gives them a healing and the man of God gives them deliverance. The man of God gives them a prophecy and then they were required to give them their tithes and their offerings. You know, I'm, I'm simplifying it, but, it's, you know, what, what's going on in Africa is really crazy. And so we're, we're burdened by this to say, okay, God's really saying, no, to be the bride made ready, you've got to change your wineskin from the externals, from being, you know, church being about signs, wonders, and miracles, to being about the internal, to being about the indwelling spirit, to being about living from the inside out instead of from the outside in. Because the bride made ready is not going to be made ready by signs and wonders and miracles. The bride being made ready isn't just going to be made ready by a revival. The, the bride is going to be made ready when the bride learns to live from the divine life that is inside of her, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. And so the church needs to get back. Instead of working for God with our hands, we live from God from our hearts. And we do out of this place of communion, we do out of this place of fellowship, we do out of this place of waiting on the Lord, and then what we do is not doing something for God and saying, God, bless me. Instead, we say, God, what is it you're doing? Lord, what is it you're saying? And we say, okay, Lord, I want to hear your voice, and then I do it, and you do it in a relationship with him. So pray for us. Pray for us because we're, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely, I feel like the Lord is calling us to, to, to go there and to confront it. And yeah, we'll need prayer because we're going against a major idol. The idolatry of, of God's, of signs, wonders, and miracles. To, to see a bride come forth that is not focused on the externals, but lives from the heart. See, what would happen if the church of Jesus Christ, just, just think about this for a second. If, what would happen if, if the church of Jesus Christ realized what God is after is not a life from the outside in. That was under, under the old covenant. The outside in. The new covenant is the inside out. What would happen if a people... The church, even with the remnant, said, okay, God, I'm changing the way I live. Instead, I'm not going to live from the outside in. I'm going to live from the inside out. I'm going to live by valuing the heart, by seeing the heart is the central part of my being. The heart is, is, is where all the issues of life spring forth. I want as much grace as I can get on my heart so that my heart becomes obedient I become obedient from the heart and motive, thought, and deed. In fact, Paul said one of the goals of the gospel is obedience from the heart. Obedience from the heart. This is what God is after, is obedience from the heart, from a people whose heart has been changed. 
So what would happen if the church of Jesus Christ began to say, we're not going to live first by the externals and what we do for God. We're going to live from the inside out. We're going to live from the indwelling life. We're going to get God's grace flowing and filling our heart, changing our heart, transforming our heart, moving our heart, so that now we obey not because we have to, but because we want to. We obey not as robots, but as lovers. We obey because now the desire to obey God has gained the victory over the demand that we must obey God. God's grace doesn't just change your actions. Grace changes the motives and intentions behind your actions. Grace makes obedience to God's commandments as natural as breathing, causing sin to be appalling rather than appealing, and righteousness to be beautiful rather than boring. Do you realize when you begin to obey God, one of the, one of the lies of the enemy is he tells you God's boring? <laughs> I'm sorry, but have you seen the heavens? Have you seen his creation? God is not boring. If you think God's boring, you're not worshiping the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture is anything but boring. And when God changes your heart, when God changes you from the inside out, you realize that he's beautiful. You realize, like we were singing earlier, his beauty captivates us. His beauty enthralls us. That forever and ever we are called to worship him before the throne of beauty and glory. It's such a beauty that the angels have been worshiping holy, holy, holy for, for just however many millions of years and billions of years. They've been worshiping holy, holy, holy. And they haven't been bored for one second. Grace gives you that desire. Grace motivates you to respond to God. Grace motivates you to respond. Here's the thing about grace. Is grace always, catch this, grace always is prior. In other words, if you find yourself being drawn to God, if you find yourself in obedience to God, I assure you it's not because you came up with a good idea and said, I'm going to now seek God. No, grace was working prior. If you right now have a desire to please him, if you have a desire to be wholehearted, if you have a desire to want to be his bride, to want to be his mature sons, to be who God's called you to be, if you have that desire, you can under you can just mark it down. Grace is working in your heart prior. Prior. Grace motivates you to respond. See, the Holy Spirit is the helper, not the doer. The Holy Spirit is not going to do it for you. The Holy Spirit is going to work in you to will and to do for his good pleasure, but it's up to you to respond to the prior grace. And if you don't respond to the prior grace of God, you can receive the grace of God in vain. And you can squander the grace of God. And you can waste the grace of God. How many Christians today are wasting and squandering the grace of God because God's moving on their heart and they're not following through that prior work of grace with obedience, with action. Faith without works is dead. If, you're, if you say you believe and you're not obeying God, then, you're, then your work, your faith is dead. That's what James says. Faith without works is dead. If you're hearing week after week after week after week after week and there's never been the implementation by obedience, then your faith is dead. Hello, are you there? Is your faith dead? Are you obeying him from the heart? See, grace motivates you to respond. Grace always works prior I'm telling you, God's grace, if it's making you passive 
if it's giving you a license to sin, if it's putting you into this place of not doing anything, of just being passive, it's not the grace of God. God's grace empowers you to respond in obedience. But here's the thing about it. God's grace is not something you can achieve. In other words, God doesn't give you grace because you pray, but when you pray. Now catch the difference there. Some think, okay, if I pray, then God is going to give me grace. No. That's earning grace. God doesn't give you grace because you pray, but when you pray. Prayer positions you to receive God's unmerited grace. God doesn't give you grace because you fast. He gives it when you fast because fasting positions you for the grace of God. God doesn't give you his grace because you read the Bible, but when you read the Bible. See, when you begin to read the word, what happens is the grace of God begins to be activated because faith is being stirred up within you and faith is how the grace of God operates and flows. See, God's grace is always prior. That's why Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, just as you have always obeyed, listen, just as you have always obeyed, work out, listen to this, Work out your salvation. Don't just think because I was born again 20 years ago that that's it. Paul said, work out your salvation. Work out your salvation. Listen, with fear and with trembling. I don't think that would be descriptive of the Western church. Are we really working out our salvation with fear and with trembling? Have we lost the fear of God in the Western church? Some people want to get rid of the fear of the Lord. We lose the fear of the Lord. We lose everything because it's the beginning of wisdom. Are you working out your salvation with fear and with trembling? Lord, I pray right now. Just stay focused. I feel like there's a lot of distractions here today. Lord, I just pray right now that we would work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Lord, bring the fear of the Lord back into our hearts, Lord. That we would work out our salvation, Lord, with fear and with trembling. Lord, I ask you for that supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. That we would work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. Now, now catch this here in, in Philippians. For it is God who is at work in you. God is at work in you. If, you. if there's anything in you that's good, if there's anything in you that's fruitful, if, if there's any blessings in your life, if there's, if there's any fruit in your life, if there's, if there's any Christ-likeness in your life, it's because God is at work in you. If there's any desire for God whatsoever, it's because God is at work in you. God's grace is always prior. And so what God is looking for is for us to respond to the prior work of God's grace. God's working out both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is working in you so that you will respond wholeheartedly to what he wants you to be and to become. This is the, a beautiful, Philippians 2, 12 through 13, is a beautiful description of what it's like to cooperate with the grace of God, what some scholars have called synergism. It's the synergy. It's God's grace working and you responding. God's grace working and you responding. God's grace influencing your heart and you obeying. It's, it's this synergy that of God working in us responding, this beautiful synergy of life, of taking on his yoke and walking with him in relationship with him.
See, not only... See, here's the thing. Paul warned is that you can receive the grace of God in vain. We can receive the grace of God in vain. God help us that we don't receive the grace of God in vain. See, there is a responsibility in the grace of God... And that responsibility is to respond to God's ability. Your responsibility in the grace of God is to respond to God's ability. To believe that God is at work in you. To believe God that he who began a good work in you is going to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. See, Grace is that responsibility, your responsibility, your responsibility in grace is to respond to God's prior work of grace in obedience. Corey Ten Boom said that it's not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. It's not my ability, it's not your ability. It's your response, it's my response to God's ability that counts. What counts is that I'm saying yes to God, not just verbally, not just with mental assent, but with action. Faith without works is dead. I'm not just giving mental assent or verbal confession to it. I'm saying yes, God, and I'm following it through with obedience. Don't look at the word of God and be a forgetful hearer, be an effectual doer. Are you obeying what God is saying for you to do? How is your obedience or is your faith dying? Is your faith dead? Your faith can die. Your faith, that's why we were talking about in worship today, and it should bring the fear of God in us, is when Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith on the earth? Your faith, my faith, our faith can die. It can grow dead. That's why Jesus looked at the, uh, the church of Sardis and said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Their faith died. Your faith can die. Don't let your faith die. Carry it out with obedience. Carry it out with obedience. You have a responsibility in the grace of God to obey, to say yes, and to carry it through all the way, to bear fruit with perseverance. Persevering faith. Persevering faith. Eugene Peterson, who wrote the Message Bible, called it long obedience in the same direction. I love that. That's a great... That's what persevering faith is. That's what bearing fruit with perseverance is is long obedience. We're running a marathon, not a sprint. It doesn't matter how you start. It matters how you finish. Long obedience in the same direction. Long obedience in the same direction. Listen, it's not how you start the race that matters. It's how you finish the race. Wherever you are on that journey... Get back up and go forward like we were singing about earlier. Go back up and run that race with endurance. Don't quit. Don't allow yourself to grow sluggish. Don't allow yourself to drift. Don't allow yourself to become complacent and apathetic and passive. It's time. We're living at the end of the age. The dawn of the ages has come. We're shifting into a new age. The Lamb of God is coming back, and he's coming as a lion, and he's going to see, will I find faith on the earth when I come? Don't let your faith die. Stir up that faith to produce works of obedience. See, under grace, you are responsible to respond in obedience to the new desires God works into your heart. It's not just... God working in your heart and you not obeying, but 
God working in your heart and then obeying what he said, working out that salvation. See, some people think, oh, because Jesus paid the price on the cross and the cross is finished, it is finished. That means I don't have to do anything. And then the, the scriptures are very clear. No, you have a responsibility. Put to death your flesh, put to death your flesh and live by the spirit. The, the way I think about the flesh is if you've seen Star Wars, Jabba the Hutt, to me, is the perfect picture of the flesh. That's what the flesh is like. That's what I felt like. You go on vacation and you don't have much time with the Lord. We had a great time. But by the end of the week, you feel a little bit like Jabba the Hutt. You know, you just, you just feel sluggish, fleshly. And God has given us a responsibility to crucify the flesh, to put the flesh to death so that the spirit of Jesus Christ in you can live. You're under obligation, brethren, to no longer live according to the flesh because if you're living according to the flesh, you will die. Paul said, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. These are the ones who are putting to death the deeds of the flesh, are sons of God. In closing, God's grace is unmerited. God's grace cannot be earned. God's grace empowers you because it is divine power to be who God's called you to be, being before doing. God's grace empowers you to do what he's called you to do. God's grace enables you to overcome the flesh, the world, the flesh, and the devil. God's grace operates when you know your need. God, help me. I need your grace. When you are at that place, God's grace begins to flow. God's grace begins to work. God's grace works when you know your need. God's grace works prior to giving you new desires that, want, that makes you want to obey God and your responsibility in the grace of God is to respond to the prior work of God's grace through obedience. And I'll just close with this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Amen. Amen. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bless you. I thank you, Lord, that you're good, and I thank you, Lord, for your grace. I thank you, Lord, that your grace is powerful. Your grace, God, is power. And I just thank you that we cannot achieve your grace. We can only receive your grace. And I just pray right now, Lord, for everyone listening that, that sees themselves in a particular need, they're in a, they're in a situation where they're, they're, they're in need of the grace of God. I pray, Lord, we're all in the need of grace of God. Those who know their need, I need it. If you need the grace of God, just open your heart to the Lord right now. Just raise your hands. Just receive right now the grace of God. Even listening online, if you feel like you need the grace of God, I just ask you, Lord, right now, that you would release the grace of God to everyone who has their hands raised. I have my hands raised. Lord, would you release the grace of God right now? Lord, no matter what people are going through, trials, fire, tribulation, challenges, warfare, Lord, even when you may not take those things away that you tell us to overcome through them, not go around them, to go through them by faith and to overcome by faith. Lord, I'm praying right now for everyone that they would be, they, the, the power of the grace of God would be released into them. Lord, would you transmit the power of God into them, into every one of us, God, that your power would be, would be released in us. Your power would would be perfected in us, Lord, we pray. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your grace, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We're going to end the online portion now.